My name is Sherry Erkman. I am a professor of thoracic surgery at Temple University Health Systems. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the social determinants of lung cancer care and to look at some uh, causes and potential solutions for the uh, disparity in cancer care. In a previous talk, we had discussed social determinants of uh, lung cancer care in terms of risk, screening and early detection, and treatment. And we know that the incidence of lung cancer is higher among African Americans and Black Americans compared to other races. But there are also other factors in terms of the risk of lung cancer. We know that they're not only um, factors of smoking and how the smoking uh, environment and smoking culture disproportionately impacts uh, lower socio socioeconomic groups, but we also know that factors such as biology, family history, and environment, exposure to radon and asbestos are also disproportionately impacting underserved communities. And so the risk of lung cancer is higher in underserved communities. We also know that there is a disparity in um, early detection of lung cancer. We know that screening is the best way to detect and treat cancer, lung cancer uh, in particular, uh, successfully. Unfortunately, there's a disproportionate uh, uptake of lung cancer screening. And if we cannot get high risk groups who are underserved groups to cross the... As we look at addressing health care disparities in lung cancer care, I think it's best to rely on a research framework uh, proposed by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And they've created a research framework that divides health disparities into levels of influence, individual, interpersonal, community, and societal. And at each of these levels, there are domains of influence. And so to, uh, for example, when you look at lung cancer, at the individual level, there are biologic factors, namely nicotine metabolism or susceptibility to uh, cigarette smoke. There are individual behavioral issues, the smoking behavior and uh, what are the physical environment and social norms of smoking. Uh, what is the environment in terms of exposure to asbestos or radon? And then at the individual level, there's always the issue of insurance coverage. So as you start to uh, look at healthcare disparities, there are many, many complex ways to address it, but having this research framework uh, helps us understand, tackle it box by box, and uh, to move forward. So. Uh, this is a very dense slide, and certainly you can look at it a little bit more closely and um, think about what are the different levels of influence. But um, to give a case study of how this comes into play, uh, we'll look at lung cancer screening. And we already discussed how uh, lung cancer screening is a way, a means, a bridge to early detection and successful treatment. But we also know that there are barriers at the individual level to getting screened. We did a study among our high-risk group, smokers in our uh, largely underserved, predominantly African-American population, and we found that 96% of people were unaware of lung cancer screening, unaware that low-dose CT scan could detect it, and really unsure that lung cancer was treatable. 56% of people really felt uh, nihilism and felt that lung cancer was not something that could be successfully treated if detected early. There are also factors um, that individuals reported like home and work responsibilities, time, and competing health issues. So, of course, all of these contribute to uh, people who are in underserved communities, all of these are barriers to screening. And then layer on top of that, providers, providers themselves can uh, identify barriers to getting their patients screened. 
For instance, 36% uh, of people said time is a barrier to screening their patients. Inadequate staffing, competing comorbidities, uh, access to shared decision-making, knowledge on the most up-to-date evidence of lung cancer and screening, and an infrastructure for follow-up. So you can see how we have these layers of barriers at the individual level, at the provider level, at the institutional level, and really at the uh, national level as well. So when we look at lung cancer screening, we also want to look for possible solutions. And we've used strategies of outreach and education, really bringing the education to people in both printed form and web form, in uh, cultural and language specific ways, and to reaching out using um, social media and patient stories uh, and websites that are easily accessible and navigable. We've also used um, strategies and uh, resources from the GoTo Foundation, and these are a couple examples of websites that have patient information, and you can direct your patients to uh, the GoTo Foundation or the American Cancer Society. There's strategies from government agencies, including a nice page uh, at the CDC and a very informative page put out by the NIH in the links you see here. This is a great resource from AHRQ, uh, which gets, it's really a checklist for providers to do lung cancer screening. And this is a great resource, not only to um, educate individual providers, but to get a whole program up and running that this is a very uh, useful handout that you can pass along to providers to encourage screening. It's always good to go to the source, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendation. There's a lot of great background evidence that informs their grade B recommendation, and it's a little bit dense, but it is a, an excellent resource to understand lung cancer screening and the most current evidence. There are also uh, resources from the uh, American uh, College of Radiology. There are even uh, shared decision-making links. There are printable handouts to look at uh, things like misunderstanding the efficacy of lung cancer and even some examples of uh, epic order sets and epic uh, smart phrases for electronic medical records. There is also uh, specific information about shared decision-making, and shared decision-making is a really, really uh, challenging part of lung cancer screening. In a study that looked and recorded uh, physicians and their shared decision-making visit before lung cancer screening, the review of the interaction really demonstrated that physicians were universally recommending lung cancer screening for people who are eligible that a discussion of the harms was virtually absent. And the mean time spent in discussing lung cancer screening was less than one minute or less than 8% of the total time. And there was no evidence in all of the uh, patients, uh, patient provider interactions. There was no evidence that a decision aid or patient education materials were used um, to inform patients. So shared decision-making is particularly challenging, and yet it is a required element of lung cancer screening. Um, so here are a couple resources. Again, the AHRQ site to uh, uh, link you to resources of shared decision-making. Option Grid is a uh, shared decision-making tool developed at Dartmouth, and Should I Screen is also a great resource. And there are some publications looking at the comparison of these um, shared decision-making resources. This is a great resource, uh, screenlc.com. Not only does it provide a risk calculator and shared decision-making tools, but some other very uh, informative, um, quick resources uh, that can be accessed even in the clinic. When we look at barriers uh, and mitigating barriers, one strategy that we've used is a single visit lung cancer screening. And this is a process where patients come in, 
and they're engaged through their healthcare provider or directly from community outreach. But once they come in, they can get shared decision making, low dose CT, uh, results, receipt of results, and coordination of follow up care at the same visit, and being able to consolidate all of the um, elements of lung cancer screening into a single visit, we were able to deliver lung cancer screening to a large underserved population. And um, currently we're looking at 2,500 patients and almost 3% received a cancer diagnosis and uh, looking at um, you know false positives and uh, false positive rate of about 12% in people who actually underwent procedures as a result of false positive, we're able to report community-specific data on lung cancer screening to our patients and uh, provide this for informed decision-making. And of course, COVID. Um, there are barriers and COVID is a huge barrier outside the scope of this particular talk, but looking at strategies to overcome barriers posed by COVID-19, including telemedicine, and um, we're working to compare in-person versus telemedicine screening. But again, it's really difficult to uh, layer on another uh, level of barriers that COVID-19 posed. So uh, going back to the healthcare disparities in the research framework, um, I think it's important to not only look at the individual and the healthcare provider and the relationship, but to also look at the community and the society level. When we look at lung cancer, it's, it's too big a problem, but I wanted to present a case study on looking at community and society strategies with, uh, with radon. And so um, this is a great model for looking at community and society approaches to disparities in radon. Um, I don't know if you know, but January is National Radon Month. This is part of a large campaign um, with the NIH to uh, inform people about the risks of radon. And this is a great uh, summary of the National Radon Action Plan and the progress over the last five years. And on the right, you see all of the agencies, not only in uh, private sector and uh, um, professional foundations and professional organizations, but looking at the EPA and the CDC and the U.S. Department of Hel Housing and Urban Development that really engaging all of these entities at a national level and a community level has impacted uh, the understanding of radon. I'm looking at radon, some of the things that they strategically focused, uh, focused on are government and private sector commitment to radon reduction. And this means creating regulations and codes and standards for housing. And of course, this requires a great partnership and coordination among people at the community and the national level. Also a priority is to invest in this and really loans, incentive, and research support. Again, this can't be done at an individual patient level or a healthcare provider level. This has to be a coordinated effort at the community and national level. Um, there's also a focus on making testing and mitigation an actual industry to support the industry and to support the need for it, and to look at uh, widespread education to increase visibility of radon amongst home builders, real estate agents, public buildings, schools, um, the health sector, and communities, and really normalizing the conversation about radon. So this is uh, important, the strategy that not only looks at individuals, and providers, but we really need a comprehensive strategy for lung cancer that looks at the community level and the national level. And so again, focusing back on healthcare disparities, there are things at the community and the society level that we need to address, namely exposure to lung cancer risk in the community level and the national level and the efforts to work on smoking and smoking cessation and accessibility of cigarettes to our population 
end. You know, when we look at awareness, uh, this is something that has to happen at the community level and advanced through policies and laws and financial support. So you can see how disparities of lung cancer care are multifactorial, but the solutions should also be looking at multiple levels. So when we're looking at lung cancer and the continuum of care, from risk to screening to treatment, we need to make sure that we're also addressing each of these at the individual, the interpersonal, the community, and the society level. And this research framework is a great place to start. And um, these are only a couple examples of ways to address healthcare disparities uh, um, in lung cancer. So I appreciate your attention and thank you. Please contact me if you have any questions.